If we want to protect, restore, and sustainably manage natural capital, one of the challenges we need to overcome is how to measure and monitor the changes that our activities and investments are having on the ground in these vast, dynamic, complex natural systems. If you consider that in one hectare of tropical forest, you can have over a hundred species of trees. You can have tens of thousands of species of insects. Now, it's easy to get overwhelmed at this point thinking, what are we going to do with all that data? How do we sort through it? And at the same time, if, if you zoom out and consider the spatial scale of the challenge we're dealing with, every year we lose 10 million hectares of, of forest to deforestation. And we have ambitions to restore hundreds of millions from a degraded state back into uh, natural functioning ecosystems. So the challenge, selectively gathering and processing the data available, and from that, delivering information that local land stewards, practitioners, investors, and other stakeholders can use to make decisions is going to be a, a big challenge. But I have three pieces of good news for you. The first piece of good news is that from a scientific basis, I think we have this covered. We do have a good understanding of what's going on in the natural world. According to Google Scholar, I checked yesterday, there have been 34,000 papers published in the last 12 months on the topics of carbon and biodiversity monitoring. That's one every 15 minutes. You literally couldn't read them and keep up if, if, if you tried. So the second piece of good news is that we have a new emerging and exciting sector known as uh, nature tech. And nature tech companies are developing and deploying powerful technology that can take our scientific and traditional knowledge and package that up into intelligence that we can use on the ground to deliver positive outcomes. And the third piece of good news is just for you guys in the room here, we have assembled an amazing panel of individuals who are working at the cutting edge of, of nature tech. These guys are harnessing the power of, of new technologies, working with the blockchain, working with sensors on, on satellites, DNA analysis, cloud computing. I think um, apart from uh, the professor earlier, these guys probably have the coolest jobs in, in the room. We're very lucky to have them here. So um, before I introduce the, the panel, I'll let them introduce themselves by way of a, a quick introduction. My name is Adam Gibbon. I am the Natural Capital Lead at AXRIM. So what I do is lead our strategy to deploy project finance and private equity into the natural capital space. So without further ado, I'm going to let the panel and tell you a little bit about the companies that they uh, work for and some of the ch uh, challenges that they're trying to solve. Um, before we'll start throwing out a few questions and get a conversation going around this topic. So let's start with uh, Murray. Brilliant. All right, well, thank you very much. And to Walid and uh, Vian, everybody's in, been involved in this. Thank you very much for having us. I'm Murray Collins. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Space Intelligence. Um, I'm a recovering academic. You mentioned <laughs> those, those papers. So I was one of those. Don't worry, I'm OK. Um, we're, we're doing very well, in fact. Um, and I was, I, was great to, uh, I was grateful to hear from Ian uh, talking about life in the rainforest. So I've been living and working in rainforest for the past uh, 24 years on and off. Uh, through to PhD and various fellowships. Um, Ian describes elephants and gorillas as very friendly, wonderful characters. I will pick a bone with him on that because elephants and gorillas do chase you through the jungle, which is very, very tough when you're trying to measure trees. Um, so I decided to leave academia uh, in 2018, uh, co-founded Space Intelligence. And what we offer is digital monitoring, reporting, and verification of what's called nature-based solutions projects. So the investment in natural capital to conserve it and restore it. Um, I'm pleased to say that in the audience somewhere we have uh, Stuart Clenahan uh, from Green Gold Forestry, who's one of the uh, partner <coughs> organizations we work with, which uh, is a, a, a one of the best in class, I think, fair to say, projects which is out there at the moment doing this kind of work of conserving uh, forests. So. Uh, what we do as a company, how do we provide this information? We just heard the tail end of that talk was all about data. So uh, in order to be able to invest uh, and have confidence uh, in, in what you're investing in, in the, in the domain of natural capital, you need information. So you need to support the transparency and integrity of these markets. How we provide that information is the analysis of huge amounts of satellite data. So we're 43 people up in, uh, primarily up in Edinburgh. Uh, we have 10 PhDs on the team, uh, all experts in the analysis of big data from space, 
but at the intersection with uh, specialisms in ecology. So uh, we're, we're mapping hundreds of millions of hectares around the uh, world at the moment, and we, our clients are typically uh, asset managers, developers of projects, uh, and people who are investing directly into the project. So um, it's a very, very exciting time. There's an, I, I guess the, the key takeaway is there's an enormous amount of activity in this space, and it's a brilliant panel assembled today. So on that note, I'll hand over. No, great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Waleed, um, Maria Balance Earth, for having me. It's great to be here. Um, so I'm Robert Heilberg. I lead growth at a company called Declimate. And we think a lot about how we can solve core challenges around valuing natural resources, natural capital, and funding academic research and science um, through really unlocking the power of data, um, people's access to data, um, and where they can share that data. And so what we provide um, is an open infrastructure layer um, for sharing critical information about our planet, so simple data on rainfall, soil moisture, temperature, and carbon, um, to advanced hazard and risk models um, that are critical um, for communities to plan um, around climate events in advance, um, so that they can either access that data easily um, through an open marketplace, um, or share that data either for free, um, or um, to monetize and fund um, further research in the space. But the infrastructure layer goes a bit further than that. And what we really look at is how we can take data that most people can't understand that's in its rawest form and turn it into actionable insights, intelligence, advanced tooling, and ultimately financial <coughs> products like parametric insurance um, so that we can help communities and businesses build financial and physical resilience um, against climate change. And so the idea here is that you have all of this great data um, around the world and all of these data scientists and engineers and climate scientists who have the tools to build um, next generation products. But one of the key barriers is having access um, to that data. And so working um, with those key stakeholders and with the team that we've assembled at D-Climate, we're figuring out how we can solve those core data problems. And so one of the things that we look at is digital MRV um, for carbon markets. And not just MRV, oh, but we how we- ahead then. No, I th <laughs> actually, I think that there's a ton of ways that we can work together because one of the things that I love about the carbon space is that there's so much room for collaboration. That's one of the key uh, you know, themes of today. But looking at how we can digitize um, key aspects of the market structure for carbon financing so that we can add um, additional layers of trust, accountability, um, so that you know, corporate stakeholders who have set very ambitious 2030, 2040, 2050 net zero goals um, can you know, look at carbon financing and the financing of nature-based solutions um, as a major asset and a tool um, for their overall sustainability strategies. And so um, that's a nutshell of what we do, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. So I'll turn it over to you, Stephanie. Thank you very much. My name is Stephanie Kaiser. I work for Nature Metrics. Uh, thank you for the previous presenter for mentioning us as an investee. Okay. I'm the sector head for nature-based solutions and carbon market, and as such, uh, on a daily basis, I deal with investors in and developers of projects um, mostly carbon projects, land-based projects that can be marine projects, rainforest projects, red plus projects, restoration projects, any country, well, almost any country in the world, different ecosystems, and they all have one common interest. They want to create robust baselines to assess what is the animal diversity that they have on their land and how is it changing over time due to their interventions. And that's the data, that's robust data that they, they can then use for their reporting and also to participate in future biodiversity crediting uh, mechanisms. As such, we're engaging and um, working for pilot projects for the Plan, Plan Vivo methodology. We're working with Red Plus projects who then feed in to get certified with Sinclair Vincent under the VERA standard. And we're participating in this, in this conversation. What I find exciting is that today, the day started with Ian's great presentation, I think the second one, where he actually told us what is actually the asset. So on the ground, when we're looking at biodiversity, what is biodiversity? So biodiversity is gorillas, biodiversity is the endangered species that you want to monitor in a Red Plus project to get to CCP gold, which increases the value of your carbon credits. But biodiversity is also the soil biodiversity in your farming system, in your woodland creation system. And the soil biodiversity actually underpins the health and the resilience of your land-based projects. So we want to find, we want to act in this space between 
nature, which is crazy, it's a lot of things, it's very emotional, and data for your boardroom. So at Nature Metrics, our goal, what we're doing is we deliver at the end actionable metrics, species richness, functional diversity, evolutionary diversity, etc., that can directly be fed into the different frameworks that we have talked about today. But we actually start in the field. So what we do is we have developed <clears throat> a standard kit. It's a bit like a PCR test or crime scene investigation that we send out to our clients. The clients come to us and say, Stephanie, this is our land, 100,000 hectares, Amazon, Peru. We want to have all the ICN listed species. Or someone in Scotland says, um, we want to participate in the Plan Vivo standard. We want to have soil metrics and want to track that. Or we have someone who um, is a mining company and they want to combine eDNA with Earth's observation to uh, create a map of biodiversity prioritization and inform where should they destroy, where should they inset, etc. Right? So we look at that first and say, where should you take your samples? Then we send them the kits where they can use any workforce in the field. They can use in the uh, communities, uh, existing workforce. They take the samples of soil and water, send them back to us, and then we use standardized processes to identify the species in the sample based on the DNA that these species have left in the environment. Um, at the end, we deliver a list of the species that are present across that project and the associated metrics. So why we like that is because if you only rely, nothing against traditional ecological methods, but if you only rely on them, you will have a very crazy and diverse data set, which often is very objective, relies on expensive uh, consultants from abroad necessarily sometimes, but there will not be a lot of consistency and it will be a data set that will be difficult to integrate with Earth's observation, maybe bioacoustics, and it will get messier and messier as you then use those data uh, for metrics and then in methodologies and the blockchain and so forth. So that's what we as, with, as this technology provider want to contribute to this puzzle that is investment in natural capital. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, my name's Anne Thompson. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm uh, from a, a Centurion organization, most of you will know is it's uh, IBM, uh, we're the sustainability technologists. Uh, my current role, so I'm a partner in the company and I run all of our global sustainable finance and ESG offerings. But I'm also uh, a little bit of a techie, so when we come to data and technology, uh, I do actually write some um, one, probably this 15,000 that you quoted, uh, my own white papers and patents in particular around carbon sequestration in, around the oceans, the most recent one. I do have a very cool job, I have to say. So I get to work on pr programs like uh, the autonomous uh, vessel with the Mayflower. Probably most of you in the UK know about it from Plymouth to Plymouth last year, where we actually start to create new data sets, which haven't been created historically in the past, but also leveraging other technologies in a holistic manner, which are required obviously for the reporting and for the standards. Um, but to probably echo, uh, uh, echo David's uh, comments, um, actually provide it in a consumable format that corporations can use, leverage today, not just for reporting, to act, but also to operationalize that. I would, uh, just to stay on the intros, um, I know we're coming from a bit of a larger, and I'm probably one of those expensive consultants, so I apologize. <laughs> but um, what I would say in my sort of 16 years um, being on the road, we don't just uh, talk the talk, but we do walk the walk. So certainly for my organization, it's great that we have obviously various accolades, but we started actually in 1971 um, with our sustainability agenda, just to put this into context. And we have around 40,000 researchers, uh, so from a science lens, that we then leveraged specifically for what we're talking about here today. So super excited, super stoked. Again, thank you to the Rebalance Surf team for allowing us to be here on stage. And just to do a tedious link, uh, we obviously are also supporting uh, when it comes to uh, recognition um, uh, of uh, different wildlife species, um, which we're obviously here today uh, to discuss. So yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much to the panel. Fantastic uh, introduction. So. To kick off the questions, I was reading in a Capital for Climate report um, last week that the uh, nature tech market is now a, a two billion a year investment market and, and growing fast. So I wondered if, if you had a few comments on, first of all, uh, the extent to which uh, this, this drive in the market is being driven by uh, new technologies, or are you able to build on technologies that have already been, existed for some time and, and repurposing them? 
and any other drivers that you see that's leading to this uptick in, in interest in, in the products and services that your companies have to offer. Um, perhaps we could start at the end. Go yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I'll probably give you two examples, if I may. So um, in terms of technologies, we don't always need to reinvent the toolkit. Um, and I think that's an important point to, to mention because where we keep coming back to this data conundrum, where do we get the data from? There's different ways to lever leverage the existing technology stacks that are out there. So I was, uh, before we came in, I gave a little example of uh, actually vodka. And uh, I know we're here to talk about nature today, but um, we actually had a way of quantifying the liquid of a supermarket and because they were selling bubble bath and not vodka. So what's this got to do with nature? Actually, when coming back to the Mayflower, we attached that to the autonomous vessel. We're now able to look at the number of microplastics or the acidification or phytoplankton levels with the exact same technology. So I think that's one classic example. The other part to come to some of the earlier panels where there's a lot being discussed on greenwashing or green hushing today is about how to provide more absolute and finite data sets with regards to carbon sequestration or other biodiversity indices. So here we're obviously leveraging things of edge computing. So we're actually looking about data sensors underneath the, the uh, um, uh, if I talk about oceans specifically, underneath the sea line, as well as looking above the sea line with the geospatial data to then actually come with an absolute value. So you can really do predictive analytics and forecasting. And just to put this in the context, we're enabling one of our ecosystem partners, or so we obviously also work in a, let's say, a tech startup mindset, to hopefully deploy by 2030 7,500 new engineered reefs by just leveraging this technology. So it shows it's scalable. It shows it provides unique data streams. Obviously, it can be assetized when you're looking at it from a financial institution lens. And of course, linking it not just to climate or to nature, but also to the societal impacts. So whether it's coastal erosion, whether it's about um, restoration activities, obviously for the fisheries, all of these add up on new data sets that need to be curated, but it's all about how do you build up that network effect, and obviously that's the multiplier factor fundamentally why we're here today to address, obviously, uh, the degradation that's going on right now. Great, thanks, yes, definitely, please. Yeah, so eDNA as a technology itself is not something <clears throat> that has been invented just last year, but obviously a, a company like Nature Metrics, um, when it was founded by Kat Bruce, Bruce, a field ecologist about seven years ago, she used eDNA as part of um, her PhD and then just realized, well, actually, as now we have this demand for large-scale scalable biodiversity monitoring, we could produce specific eDNA-based products to cater for that need. So I guess it's in this case not a completely new technology, mm -hmm. fairly new, but it's like how, how do you package this, which primers do you use. Now, if we're looking at biodiversity monitoring itself and how this technology contributes, it contributes at three levels. Um, firstly, it can calibrate other technologies. For example, it can be used for ground truthing of Earth observation data. Secondly, it can enhance. For example, you could say you have camera traps um, to detect wildlife, you could also and or use eDNA to just get more data or more comprehensive data sets. And thirdly, we can create new data layers such as um, the detection and characterization of soil biodiversity, which was very difficult to do without eDNA. Yep. Um, the you know, primary you know, use case I think about for lowering costs is parametric insurance. And so DClimate was spun out of another company called Arbel, which focuses on data-driven parametric insurance for weather and climate events. So mainly working with farmers, um, energy companies, um, you know, large-scale agribusinesses to you know, hedge and manage their exposure to a number of different weather perils um, using data. And so that was kind of the base layer that formed the DClimate network. But when you're thinking about how you can you know, chip away at the you know, sizable protection gap that exists around the world um, for weather catastrophes. I think Aon for the 300 billion plus of damages last year estimated that 58% of those were not covered um, by insurance programs. So indemnity um, is great, but it's hard to scale um, for um, climate events, specifically when you're dealing with subsistence and smallholder farmers, because you're not going to be able to send an adjuster on a plane um, to some parts of Africa in order to physically um, assess damage. And then you also have the issue of a lot of farmers who need access to coverage not 
having the capital or not wanting to pay upfront premium for an uncertain outcome. And so one of the things that we're able to do um, you know, using data is you know, structure parametric insurance programs um, that are targeted towards you know, smallholder um, farmers in parts of the world that either have poor um, data availability or quality um, or that don't have um, infrastructure that's essential um, for implementing traditional insurance programs where you need a boots on the ground approach. And so we did a program um, in Cambodia where we were able to work with a cooperative in order to insure farmers for as little as $11 in premium. And how are we able to do that? By automating a lot of the processes that are traditionally done by humans. So all of the um, underwriting um, is done by artificial intelligence, which learns how to distribute a book and then is able to um, scale that coverage to different parts of the world. Um, a lot of the operational efficiencies are automated by blockchain technology. Now, there are blockchain approaches to insurance that are great, but a lot of farmers don't want to have to interact with a MetaMask or figure out how to you know, use a cryptocurrency. It's just about what's under the hood and how you get the car from point A um, to point B. And then the third function is how you can automate the payments process so that there's trust in the underlying data that's being used so that you know that it's not being manipulated um, during the coverage period and so that payments are dispersed in a speedy manner to a farmer so that they're not waiting months to go through a settlements process. Um, if a catastrophic event has happened because most you know, farmers or agribusinesses are one major weather event away from financial ruin. And so that's one example where I think we can not only introduce lower costs, but greater efficiency and transparency. Great, thank you. Mori. Yes, yeah, so a good, good question. There has been a lot of VC interest in this uh, space in the past <laughs> of the two years. Um, I would say for us, I mean, we, we existed prior to uh, that big explosion. The big enabler was the fact that we had uh, and will have now amongst our senior team over 100 academic papers on how you do things like monitor above ground biomass, uh, particularly in tropical forests. So people come back to us because we've been working in this domain for a long time and haven't just jumped on a bandwagon because there's VC funding. Mm -hmm. As it turns out, we did take some VC funding and that's helped uh, us, us accelerate our, our growth profile. And that's um, all been to the, to the well and good. Uh, so in, in particular, Ed uh, Mitchard, my co-founder, um, has been publishing uh, core articles on the uh, technologies that you use um, using these earth observing satellites to, to map these key variables which we're all interested in. So uh, I know it's the, uh, the, the term which shouldn't be mentioned, but when you were talking about carbon credits, of course, those, that's derived from the estimation of above ground biomass. In order to be able to do that, you need to be able to fuse uh, and analyze huge amounts of data in a robust framework and then be able to validate that in order to be able to create a, a carbon credit project which is issuing credits and that's really been uh, our value add that said yes the, the vc injection of cash has been helpful it always helps yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful so i'd like to shift gear a bit and ask you a question about your clients or potential clients remember they may be in the room so don't be rude when you <laughs> answer my question but i'd like to to know from your when clients come to you how much do they understand about, about biodiversity, what they're doing? Do they know what they want or they're just fishing? You know, I'd, I'd be interested to, to get that from the perspective of a, yeah, a company who's, who's on the front line providing these services. So um, yeah, let's uh, start with, with Adam at the end. Okay, uh, <laughs> let me dip the toe in the water. So <laughs> I think one thing I would say um, just at a global lens. Um, so when I'm on back in this side of the pond, so it's lovely to be back home, uh, there's a, very much an embracement of uh, biodiversity, nature, and a need for, for change and action. And that was obviously clear from COP15 as well last year. When I was like last week back in New York, uh, there is a change management element to this besides the technology and the data that we're discussing here, because mm -hmm. there's very clearly still a few naysayers or a few that are pending the regulation to drive them down this road to actually do something more meaningful or impactful. I think the other part with the change management lens is really looking about what's the value and not just we heard about earlier the bottom line and hopefully we go to the quadruple bottom line. But I think it's um, even when I did a project in New York, where I was looking at social impact of urban forestry, for example, about the temperature changes, health impacts by providing a price. So absolutely applaud Ralph if he's still here um, when he was putting a price on the elephant by providing them with that lens besides, let's say, the risk assessment that resonates. 
I think there was on one of the prior panels where there was a comment made, depending who from the, the C-suite for Agben sake who you talk with, it's like, do you not talk to yourselves before mm -hmm. we actually get invited to have discussion? That's quite normal, I'm mm -hmm. afraid. <laughs> but I, I think the other thing which is driving it is those that have come up with commitments that they want to be carbon neutral or they want to be nature neutral by 2030. It's no longer good enough to have this marketing or communication element to it. And, and that's basically the starting point of the discussion as to realize, obviously, from a regulatory and legal perspective, but also then realize what's your tech stack to be able to achieve that? Because this is not an overnight transformation that you have to set yourself up for. Of course, don't put perfect in front of good, but you have to get on the bandwagon, you have to get started. I think the, the other part is um, when we're looking about not just transparency in the four walls of the clients that I work with, but actually the transparency to their client base and to the broader consumer. So there's been a lot of focus uh, when we come to materiality, but internal stakeholders, but I think the external stakeholders, and it's not been mentioned so much, but like the indigenous groups as well as to the contribution or impact, I think it's tremendous. So we work with organizations who are on the front line, meaning the sub-Saharan region or like in India where there is resource scarcity, but by actually providing them predictive analytics as to what tree species will help with water purification or what agroforestry techniques would work in that climate, that is what's driving a lot of these discussions because it's actually meaningful insights that actually helps channel the finance in the right direction rather than taking a spread betting approach. But it is a sort of a multi-journey discussion. It's not just, uh, here's a presentation, off you go. No, it really needs to have a, a collective mindset and a mind shift. And to my starting point, I think there are different tempos that the globe is going on right now. Japan, I'm pleased to say, coming back there just before Christmas, they definitely are progressing. Mm -hmm. um, but there's definitely, I think, uh, all of us need to step up to the plate and have that leadership irrespective of where we are geographically to really bring the rest of the organization on board. A bit long-winded, but hopefully <laughs> you got no, a picture. Wonderful, thank you. And, uh, Stephanie, please. Yeah, I love this question because my colleague Chris and I, we deal with a lot of <clears throat> different uh, investors and project developers, and there's like a scale of informedness. <laughs> so I'm actually going to mention a company. I spoke to um, a lady from South Pole uh, in Medellin, Colombia, and I was a dream. This was the dream client because obviously they are um, a very large company um, working in the carbon space, but they also have a dedicated biodiversity team. And this was a nice informed client and they knew about biodiversity monitoring. So the situation here was saying, okay, she said, these are projects we have. These are the things we want to measure. Just tell me, what can your technology do? And that means I tell them and then they go away. They are already have some idea of how to do the monitoring and we just assist a bit. That was, that was great. And then on the, other, on the other extreme, we have indeed got people who called us and they were maybe um, a startup or a new investor and they were like, oh wow, now everyone's talking about this. I was a client, I'm going to start a company and I'm going to get into the biodiversity space. So they would call us and say, I just got this new project, which they might have or not. And then they say, can you figure out biodiversity for me? Like, can you give me a number that tells me how good my biodiversity <laughs> is? And, and then how much money can I make from that? And so they're like, okay, well, let's start at the beginning. This is an extreme, this doesn't happen all the time. But so there's two things these people need to do. First, we've actually now opened a new department in our company called the Nature, Nature Strategy Department. And <clears throat> so uh, these higher level clients can come to us and we can tell them, okay, you've got your investments and you want to feed into TNFD or whatever, and we help them with strategic advice. But they should also go and speak to a consultant, there we have a few consultants here, and have a think first about what do you want to measure? Because we can measure a lot of things, but we then have to ask them, well, have you thought about what aspects of biodiversity you want to measure? Do you want to measure elephants? Do you want to measure the changes in insects? What are your project objectives and why? And a lot of people will not be able to answer that question. And this is what we tell them, get your objectives and your theory of change first. And this is something actually Vera CCB, I think, says in the requirements is focus on your theory of change and then the data providers will support you with the most relevant solutions. Yeah, and I mean, uh, you know, from our standpoint, I think it, you know, depends on, you know, the industry or the vertical in terms of, you know, clients, you know, knowing what they're looking for. Um, often, you know, it really just depends on, you know, us, you know, being able to listen 
and you know custom fit something um, to you know what different clients are looking for. So we work with you know the entire range. We work with the smallest you know farmers and agribusinesses to Fortune 500 companies, mm -hmm. and those are very different stakeholders in terms of their sophistication with dealing with different data products um, in to what they're actually looking for. And so it's really just about listening to actual stakeholders and as opposed to assuming what they need. And we can start by building a product and you know, retrofitting it to you know, what we think the industry is looking for, but ultimately we need to be able to go to stakeholders and say, this is what we've built, um, what do you think? And so with a lot of the MRV um, you know, tech that we've worked on, we've gone directly to um, project developers, um, to um, exchanges, to marketplaces, and said, um, does this actually solve a problem for you? And often they will come back saying, you know, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen on earth, or they'll have like six to seven different suggestions about how we can add new features that would not only, you know, improve the way that they um, do their jobs, but that would do the same for a lot of their either market competitors um, or different stakeholders in the place. Um, so, you know, the way I like to, you know, always joke and think about ourselves is that we're kind of like a classic old school Italian restaurant. We have the staple items, but we'll make you whatever you want because Ultimately, at the end of the day, it, there are different solutions for every single company, and they might be able to take kind of the core, um, you know, data product, whether it's a climate risk assessment platform or you know MRV for carbon markets, but they might need special features. So just listening, getting that feedback, and incorporating that into what we build in the future, um, so that we can you know always deliver solutions that actually solve problems. Brilliant, thank you, uh, Mario. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good question. I would say echoing. Um, uh, previous thoughts, there's definitely a range. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we're seeing now is a lot more people who are trying, trying to get into this space somehow, trying to understand what the possibilities are. And so the conversation, we have to zoom out and talk about the high level impact of what we can do. So assessing things like the above ground biomass stocks and the way that that's changed over time and helping to understand the impact of any given project. Um, I would say, though, that there's an, another parallel set of conversations we have whereby there's one or two people who have been hired as a, the remote sensing expert in a company or the GIS expert, and then they've been asked by their management team to go away and produce this new map of Africa, at which point they say, I can't do that on my own. And so the people in those organizations have in turn become our customers. So that's a key driver. Also partnerships um, in areas where we don't have a, a direct uh, route to market at the moment. We're working with people like uh, Nature Alpha, who sponsor this event. A uh, wonderful team to, uh, where we're producing data sets at scale about environmental change. That complements the kind of work which uh, Nature Alpha is doing. Their platform can be integrated with the other data sets that they curate. So there's really a, a range, but I think ultimately it's a question of managing expectations and, as you say, uh, mm -hmm. about understanding what, the, um, what the, the real need is. I would say we take a much more Fordist approach at the moment. We have like three products which we're <laughs> rinsing and, and, and repeating because otherwise you get caught in a consultancy trap. I did see that you raised a, uh, a, a flag up on time there, so I'll, I'll curtail my answer. For no, I think luckily it was the five minute flag, so we're okay. I think we've got one more time. I'm going to ask one more qu uh, uh, question. I'd like to create a bridge to the next panel. I believe it's about uh, local communities. Um, and I'd like to, if you have any quick examples um, of the way the work that you do uh, interacts with or empowers um, local communities, maybe gathering their knowledge or, or, mm -hmm. or feeding knowledge to them so they can uh, make decisions. Um, so if you have a, a really quick 30 seconds on, on one of those examples, that'll be wonderful. And then we can. Uh, wrap up. Yeah, Adam, please. Okay, um, so we work with, uh, as part of our pro bono scheme, the likes of Haifa International or GIS, um, so Sub-Sahara or Greater Line in, the, in LATAM. And with that particular community, there was obviously a know-how about the, um, the vegetation and also the social impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss. So what we do is we provided a predictive analytics to allow them to, let's say, forecast based on those trajectories, but also integrate from those local communities what is the actual impact beyond just the biodiversity, so the social impacts for obviously their generation, healthcare, et cetera. And I think that's an important one to say in that we're obviously very focused today from climate first, but not climate only, and obviously today's session being nature, but it's about that scalable engagement model and dialogue because that local know-how 
there's only so much you get from the data from whether it's geospatial or sensory data. Mm -hmm. That local knowledge needs to be fed into the AI models for the knowledge um, building. And I think I would also say more externalization of that knowledge is required. So it's great that we're working in partnerships and ecosystems, but I think the more we can centralize that, I think that will help. And hopefully that was in 30 seconds. Yeah, thank Stephanie. you very much. Um, <laughs> Stephanie, do you have yeah. an example you'd like to share? Yes, I've just been in Brazil in December. Um, uh, we did some sampling for a biodiversity methodology pilot in Brazil in an indigenous community. And our business model is that the sample collection, we're hands off. It, anyone can do that. And the idea is that the local communities do it themselves. So when we went there, um, they were in charge. We just helped organize the groups a bit. And we worked with some local hunters that we need them. Well, they, they know where to go and they organize the sample design. And then when we sent the data back, uh, we will get a list of species and sometimes there might be gaps in the species identification. So then it's a really beautiful opportunity to bring in indigenous knowledge and say, oh, we can see there's three different species. We don't have the name. And so often if you, if you talk to them, they will say, oh, yeah, these three fish, it could be them. And then we can um, barcode them and actually discover new species. But we definitely need to work with the indigenous communities on that. Yep, absolutely. Um, everything starts on the ground with local communities. And you know, from our standpoint, we want to make sure that we empower them to both share and have the ability to um, you know, make data available to the rest of the world. Um, that's critical for understanding the communities where they live. And then also have the ability to access you know, insights about you know, their communities, about the projects that they're working on um, in a way that's you know, not only affordable but open. And so two examples of that are, again, on the MRV side, where we are making it possible for small nature-based solutions to access insights in a way um, that they can understand and where they can do monitoring um, on a quarterly or more frequent basis. The second example is for coffee growers. We have an application where they can geofence their farm and access um, predictive analytics um, for the next few months um, so that they can plan proactively around different climate and weather variables. And so just making sure that there is an open infrastructure layer so that people can get and share data easily and use that as a tool for, again, building resilience against um, climate risk, both um, physical risks and financial risks. Yeah, I, I would say there's probably 60, 70 years of literature about how fundamentally important working with communities in the place where the natural capital is uh, to conserving that natural capital. Um, so uh, if you're looking for specific examples, so, uh, in terms of frameworks, Plan Vivo as a, mm -hmm. as a standard uh, for nature-based solutions projects is particularly uh, a pro-poor focused one, which is worth taking a, a look at um, as a specific example of a real-world forest conservation project which works actively with communities. Then I suggest you go and harangue Stuart Clenahan. I'm sure he'll stand up at some point and talk about the work that he's doing in Peru, work with local communities uh, with like non-timber forest products, etc., to support a different model of economic development. So, Great. There you go. Thank you very much to, to the panel. Well, well, I hope, um, you know, I think for some people, nature can be complex and scary, and, and maybe technology is the same for other people as well. But hopefully, um, by bringing the, the two together, as, as the panels do, the panelists have been doing here, um, we, we can create some comfort and some, some space to, to move forward. Um, so I'd just like to thank again Walid and Rebalancer for, for hosting us today. And ladies and gentlemen, if you give the panel a round of applause, please. Well done.